Uh, so this is the panel on global logistics, and I'm Richard Applebaum. I'll moderate the panel. Um, <clears throat> I'm a professor of sociology and global and international studies here at UCSB. And um, <clears throat> I like to think that I got Nelson partly launched um, in this interest in containers uh, because he and I um, and his wife, Eileen Boris, and my wife visited the Yantian International Container Terminal in Shenzhen, China, two years ago. And uh, that experience, I guess, stuck with Nelson uh, quite deeply. So what I'd like to do is first introduce the four panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. And then my principal role will be a timekeeper and moderator. Um, <clears throat> Paula Hamilton is a doctoral student in the Department of Geography at Queen Mary College, University of London. She came the longest distance, and since this is about logistics, we're having her go first. Um, on her day job, she is a researcher at the International Transport Federation. Her work explores the growth of the global logistics industry, its role in the world economy, and the impl implication of changes in that sector for employment and industrial relations in the transport industry on land, sea, and air. Her talk will be entitled, DHL Global Logistics, A Geographer's Perspective. She will be followed by Andrew Herod, who is Professor of Geography and Adjunct Professor of International Affairs and of Anthropology at the University of Georgia. That's Georgia in the United States, so he did not come quite as far as Paula. Um, he is author of Labor Geographies, Workers and the Landscape of Capitalism. He's editor of Organizing the Landscape, Geographical Perspectives on Labor Unionism, and co-editor of The Dirty Work of Neoliberalism, Cleaners and the Global Economy and An Unruly World, Globalization, Governance, and Geography. His talk is entitled Containers, Contracts, and Geography, Responding to Technological Innovation Through Remaking the Labor Landscape. Um, Andrew will be followed by Peter Payton, who is Secretary of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 63. He is a working longshoreman in Los Angeles and a co-chair of the ILW's Port Security Committee. His talk is entitled, Labor and Logistics in a Global Industry. Um, and finally, um, Alan Sakula, who you heard from um, last night, writer, critic, and filmmaker. His books include Photography Against the Grain, Fish Story, Titanic's Wake, and Performance Under Working Conditions. His films include Tsujuji, Tsujuji, um, The Lottery of the Sea, and a short film for Laos. He teaches in the photography and media program at the California Institute of the Arts. His talk is The Aesthetics of a Containerized World. Uh, so we'll begin with Paula. Okay, so good morning everyone, and thank you for my invitation. I'm very happy to be in California at this time of the year. It's good, teamwork. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk about a company called DHL XL Supply Chain. And this is basically, this is part of a wider research project and the paper draws upon uh, observations at a number of different facilities in Germany, Hong Kong, the USA and the UK and also in-depth interviews with senior management throughout the company. Um, the majority of the interviews are actually within particular sectors, so within the automotive contract logistics division and within the fast-moving consumer goods division. So, what am I going to cover? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about how DHL XL supply chain came into being. I'm going to look at some perspectives on analyzing the contemporary global economy from a chains and networks perspective. And then I'm gonna go into some of the results from my research findings. And that's looking at the uh, types of contracts this company is winning and the scales at which these contracts operate. Issues around uh, power and control and interfirm relationships, and I'm going to particularly focus on the client and contract logistics provider relationship. And then I'm going to look at the influence of non-firm actors within global production networks, and for that I'm going to focus on uh, the role of trade unions in shaping production networks and the logistics, supply uh, the logistics activities within 
those networks. So uh, DHL, Excel Supply Chain, is actually part of a company called Deutsche Post World Net, which started its life as the German post office. It currently employs, as an organization, over 500,000 workers directly, of which over 150,000 are situated within DHL XL supply chain. And in, it also has, uh, within its, uh, the way the company is structured, there is a, a logistics division, and that's where the freight forwarding operations under DHL Global Forwarding are placed, and the contract logistics is placed under DHL XL supply chain. And as uh, is probably familiar from yesterday and this morning, the evolution of these co companies has basically been through a series of acquisitions. So in this case, uh, Deutsche Post, the post office, bought DHL, Danzas, and Excel. And about a year and a half prior to Excel, the purchase of Excel, Excel purchased Tibet in Britain, which is another huge logistics company. And just to emphasize the geographical perspective of this, uh, DHL, which I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call it DHL from now on because it's just too much of a mouthful. Um, it has physical operations in 41 countries. And I think that's a very important point to make because um, rather than seeing uh, globalization as a, a sort of flat thing, uh, I think it's very important that we understand it's extremely geographically uneven. And the fact that a company like DHL, which has the capacity to perform um, operations pretty much anywhere, only concentrates physical operations in 41 countries is a very significant point that we shouldn't forget. So it provides services for a range of clients in the automotive, life sciences and healthcare sectors, consumer, retail, technology, engineering and manufacturing and chemical. So it pretty much covers most of the different uh, sectors in the global economy. Its clients tend to be the major manufacturing and retail transnational corporations in the world, including companies like Ford, General Motors, Procter & Gamble. Um, so those are the kind of clients they deal with. And they provide a very wide range of logistics services, which I've just outlined up here. So as we're all aware, containerization has played a fairly important role in the development and emergence of integrated or door-to-door -door logistics providers, such as DHL, XL supply chain. Technological advancements, both in terms of communications and the invention of things like the jet engine, has also um, generated, again, these companies' uh, development. And as has been discussed in several presentations, what I would call re-regulation rather than deregulation has been a process that has been extremely important in their development. And finally, the diversification of both companies within the transport sector and external to the transport sector have been extremely important in the emergence of these huge logistics providers. And I just want to give you an example of a couple of them. So we have Deutsche Post World Net, and its contract logistics division is DHL XL Supply Chain. It emerged from the postal sector. Kuna Nagel, another huge contract logistics company, emerged from the freight forwarding sector. AP Muller Maersk, with its Maersk Logistics, emerged from the shipping sector. Kerry Properties, which is the direct or immediate parent company of Kerry Logistics, is a property development company. Li and Fung Group is a trading company. And Deutsche Bahn, which is the, not that I want to emphasize Europe in this, but is the German railway um, and is therefore a rail operator, has an enormous contract logistics division, which includes um, basically, as you will see, the, uh, through an acquisition process, both first Schenker, then Stenes, and finally Bax Global. Um, so it's now a major competitor to DHL XL supply chain as well. 
So the final factor in the emergence of these logistics companies has been the disaggregation of production. So the emergence of uh, more sophisticated and complex production networks over larger geographical distance has increased the need for these companies to become more active and to grow in terms of the global economy. So, I want to do, this is my theory slide, there's only one, so don't worry. Um, so how do we look at where these companies fit in? Well, one way of looking at them is through a network perspective, and there are a number of different um, frameworks that have been developed. The first one is the global commodity chains uh, framework, which, uh, whose most famous advocate is Gareffi. Then you have global value chains perspective, which has emerged from the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Sussex and MIT over here in the States. And then you have the global production networks framework, which is mainly associated with the um, Manchester University, and in particular, Hess, Dickin, Co, Henderson, and Young. So basically, the, the three frameworks at the core are fairly similar. They're based on the nexus of interconnected functions, operations, and transactions through which a, a specific product or service is produced, distributed, and consumed. But there are differences, and the two main differences are in terms of global commodity chains and value chains, they are essentially linear structures. And the global production network framework attempts to go beyond that. And the second difference is basically that the first two frameworks are very narrowly focused on inter-firm governance, transactions, and relationships, whereas the global production networks framework attempts to go, on, go beyond that and encompass relevant sets of actors and relationships beyond the inter-firm perspective. However, there are gaps in this framework, and there are a number of areas that are underdeveloped. In particular, each of these frameworks has kind of forgotten about logistics. I think that's the blunt way. How everything moves through these networks or chains or whatever you want to call them. The second is that they treat firms within their analysis as homogeneous entities and do not look with inside the firm at inter-firm or intra-firm relationships. And the third bit is that the area of work that tends to be underdeveloped is the looking at role of um, non-firm actors such as the state, civil society organizations, labor, and so on. So, Moving on to the more interesting bit. This is a breakdown of the different forms of contracts that I observed during my research. And you will see that they are different types of contracts to begin with. So we've called, we have a lead logistics provider contract, which I'll talk about first. And basically, this, contract, this type of contract involves the coordination of other logistics providers involved in a client's outsourced logistics function. It serves as the client's primary supply chain management provider, defining processes and managing the provision and integration of logistics services through its own organization and those of other subcontractors. So the contract that I observed operated at a European scale. It involved the coordination of 25 different logistics providers and warehouse operators within the European region, and the coordination of the movement of components from 1,500 different suppliers into all Ford of Europe's facilities within the European Union. It operated, in this case DHL did not provide any physical facilities 
it utilised the client's facilities, so it had an office within uh, Ford of Europe's facility in Cologne. Um, its staff were based there. It's, it had no overheads in terms of paying for um, office space or anything like that. It was intimately connected to different departments within Ford of Europe's facility in Cologne. And obviously, as I mentioned, it coordinated the activities of other transport and warehouse operators. The second one I've called International Import and Export, and this is a multi-regional contract. And interestingly, this again was about uh, the movement of components into, another, uh, into Ford's uh, facilities in multiple regions. However, it was, um, sorry, I've lost my space a bit. In this uh, situation, uh, uh, DHL did provide physical facilities. So it did operate its own warehousing and cross dock operations. And in doing so, it was also able to meet the needs of more than one client from that facility. So whilst uh, DHL was servicing Ford's operations internationally from this facility, it was also servicing General Motors and some of the major um, suppliers in the automotive sector. The other interesting thing about this is that uh, DHL's position within this production network that um, it held the contract in was significantly different from the lead logistics provider contract. In this case, it was under the coordination of another lead logistics provider who was one of its major competitors in the automotive contract logistics sector. In the third situation, we go to a very different scale. We go down to a very local scale. In this case, the company had a contract to perform the in-house operations within an assembly facility for Jaguar in the UK. So it basically coordinated local suppliers' movements into the facility at the same time as managing the in-house logistics requirements. So it was responsible for getting the right components to the right assembly worker on the right line within the facility. And in this situation, obviously, it didn't need to have its own facilities. And the final one, is operating at a subnational basis and is a distribution contract. So this was a contract with EverReady, so batteries, very important. And it was a contract that was held in southeast uh, region of the US. Uh, in this case, uh, DHL provided its own facilities on what it called its campus, which was outside Atlanta, Georgia. So basically, this was a concentration of logistics activities for multiple clients on a, a campus-like basis, a bit like Santa Barbara at the university. Um, and in this case, it also coordinated the transport movements of other carriers to the clients, customers, who were major companies like Target, um, etc. So this is just to give you a flavor of the different geographical scales at which logistics contracts are awarded and the capacity for companies like uh, DHL, XL to transfer and operate across multiple scales. So the importance of uh, making these contracts successful is very much about establishing a positive working relationship with the client and other firms operating in the production network. And what I want to do now is to briefly look at the most clearly defined relationship, which is that between the client and the logistics provider. And what you see here is in these two uh, quotes from interviews with uh, senior managers in the company, 
is a very wide spectrum of uh, relationships and power and control. So in some circumstances, these com uh, companies like DHL are able to establish, whilst they can't have an equal relationship with their client, they have a very big degree of autonomy and the capacity to interact with them in a more um, collaborative way than is normally sort of depicted. So in the situation in Hong Kong, they had very positive and well-established relationships with transnational corporations. But when they um, conducted business with Chinese firms in, Shen, in the Shenzhen and Pearl River Delta region, it was very much a case of this is an economic transaction and that's it, end of story. Um, so there's a definite distinction in terms of uh, their, their client base and the types of um, power relations that are occurring. And the second quote looks, is actually from the US. And in this situation, uh, DHL had had a contract with a huge transnational corporation for around 10 years. So they'd had a long working relationship together. And during that time, DHL had attempted to move beyond the services that it, it was contracted for. But time and again, uh, they were kind of kicked back by their, their client and said, no, this is it. That's all we want you to do. So they weren't able to expand the range of services or their relationship beyond the remit of their contract in that situation. However, in the automotive sector, uh, DHL has a, a, you know, it's pretty much the dominant company in terms of contract logistics. It only really has one or two other major competitors who could compete for business with transnationals. And it's also very well established in the UK market. So in this situation, you see the, um, their dominance within the automotive sector combined with their concentration of activities and dominance within a national market. And in this situation, they're actually able to work towards collaboration, not just with their clients, but with multiple clients and across those clients. So this is a very interesting dynamic in terms of the position of a, of a logistics provider within a production network, because actually what they're doing is pulling in several production produ places or positions within multiple production networks to work together, even though they're actually technically competing. Another interesting thing that is happening is that you kind of don't think about logistics providers being financiers. And this is another example of where um, a, a company within or a firm within a production network is basically attempting to upgrade its position within that, that network. And given the parent company that DHL um, has, which also has a bank, um, you can see the, the synergies both within DH, uh, Deutsche Post, the parent company, but you can also see uh, how um, a company like DHL is able to um, push its way further and further into the client's more traditional areas. So it's a long way from being a warehouse operative to being the financier of parts of supply chains. So the other, so that's kind of looking at some of the aspects between its client and itself. What I want to do now is to start to look at how trade unions actually influence the activities within a, a company like DHL, which has extremely low unionization rates, I have to point out. So the only two of the nine facilities I went to had any form of unionization. And one was in the UK, one was in the US. Both, strangely enough, were in the automotive sector. So you can see a correlation there between the industry that their clients coming from, unionization in that industry, and um, the capacity for workers to unionize within the logistics provider who's um, servicing such clients.
So a number of factors came out in terms of my analysis of DHL and um, organized labor. One is, obviously, as I've just discussed, the very uneven geographies of organized labor within DHL itself. Um, the second area was the capacity for organized labor either within the company or associated with the client or other actors within the production network to restrict DHL's capacity to deliver contracts and to heighten the risk in terms of service delivery. The third, as I've mentioned, is the unevenly impact, it's unevenly impact by unionization both within clients and with industry sectors that it services. And the final bit is that, again, organized labor is particularly concentrated at certain scales within a company like DHL. Okay. So this was a quote from quite a senior manager. Um, sometimes the white tape of a union environment can stop you implementing new ideas or suggestions either as quick as you'd like or you're simply not going to get them off the ground. And when he was uh, referring to this, he was not necessarily referring to his own workforce. In this case, he was referring to his client's workforce and uh, the capacity for them to shape what the company itself could do. And this second one is from the US and again is making it pretty clear. This company does not want unions inside its activities. And what was very clear from the analysis is that it will go to great lengths to remain what it calls union free. And again, this quote quite clearly demonstrates the importance of unionization within the sectors that it services. So the final one, which, was, uh, which I'm quite interested in, is actually the extent to which unions have been able to impact and to unionize within a, a company like um, DHL. Because as a, a contractor to multiple clients, it's, it's quite a challenge for unions to actually be able to um, have any form of unionization within, um, within the logistics sector or the contract logistics sector, whatever you want to refer to, refer to it as. But what you find is that the company is very clearly where it has to accept that workers want to unionize, it's doing it at the most atomized scale it can possibly get away with. So it's either on a site-by-site -site basis or a, at the most a contract-by-contract -contract basis. And it's very clear that it's unwilling to engage in any form of uh, bargaining processes with unions or with its workforce at a national or at a supranational scale. And clearly for, for the transport unions, who are extremely fragmented already and not particularly good at cooperating even at a national scale, this, this creates a huge challenge when you're dealing with a company that has 150,000 workers and you then multiply that by three to actually get the extent of the workers involved in the contracts it holds. So I'm just kind of laying the ground a little bit for Andy. And then just, just a clear idea, it clearly analyzes the different national contexts and the different unions, so it, it profiles these companies. Or unions, sorry. And then I just want to finish off with this quote, which really kind of demonstrates the power that logistics companies have in shaping production networks. But it also demonstrates the power that organized labor has within logistics companies without them actually realizing it and also within the greater um, production network itself. So I just wanted to finish with that quote because I thought it was quite meaningful and hopefully I haven't gone over time too much. I thank Paula. Andy? Uh, 
Uh, again, uh, as Paula said, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me um, to come speak today. And uh, what I want to do is to talk a little bit about a historical story uh, related to um, organizing and contract bargaining on the East Coast with Dockers. And then if I don't go over time, maybe um, try and uh, think about some uh, lessons that that might hold for us in the contemporary um, period. So the title of my uh, talk, uh, I, originally I had a much um, different title, but Nelson said, give us something a bit sexier. So I tried to come up with something a bit sexier. So containers, contracts, and geography. <laughs> Maybe that says something about my idea of sexy, I don't know. Uh, but responding to technological innovation through re remaking the labor uh, landscape. So I wanted to start off actually with a couple of quotes um, from a couple of East Coast uh, union officials um, to really get us thinking about um, issues of labor from a geographical perspective. Um, some of you might be wondering why there are actually two geographers here today talking about uh, labor. What I, what I hope to do is to uh, get you thinking about how the issue of uh, work, of um, contract bargaining, of labor markets, uh, there are many things, but one of the things is that they're deeply geographical um, processes and entities. So I think these two quotes kind of, kind of uh, bring this home. So the first is from uh, Tony Scotto, who um, had been the president of one of the ILA um, locals in Brooklyn. Um, and this is from the, both these quotes are from the 1960s. Uh, he said, the industry's oldest and deepest conflicts center in customs and practices, in work rules and cargo handling methods, habits that vary widely from port to port, creating multiple contradictions and needless fragmentation. A national agreement, identical in all major provisions, would gradually erode industrial anarchy, would curb or halt wildcat strikes, would tend to equalize profits, and would slice through and ultimately resolve the welter of conflicting special conditions that now exist in every port. Uh, Teddy Gleason, who uh, later on went to become the uh, president of the um, International, uh, said uh, about the same time, it has been our position now that all the companies that we have any control over should sit down around the table with us and make a rate for the entire United States. I believe it takes just as much strength to lift 100 pounds of sugar in Tacoma as it does in Baltimore. A docker should get the same money for doing it. Um, so what I wanted to do uh, is, as with Paula, is start off with some of the um, theory stuff, um, and then, then to, to tell you uh, about a couple of uh, strategies, geographical strategies that the ILA adopted in response to uh, containerization of the, at least the East Coast industry um, in the 19, uh, beginning in the 1950s and going through obviously to, um, to today. So uh, as I said, you might be wondering what is a, what is a geographer doing here? I, I'm sure the, the, uh, the uh, idea that there are people called labor historians is fairly uh, obvious and fairly well known, but there are actually a small group of us, um, and in fact, Paula's advisor, Jane Wills, is in the UK is one of them, who call ourselves labor geographers. Um, and so basically what we're interested in um, is the idea in which uh, work and workers' lives are socially embedded. You know, all of us are socially embedded, um, excuse me, spatially embedded. Um, you know, where we work, we're tied in with particular local uh, communities that themselves are then tied into broader national uh, and global relationships. Um, if I decide to uh, get in my car and drive for five minutes, I can cover a greater geographical distance in those five minutes than if I walk uh, in five minutes. So I think all of us can think about how our lives are geographically, how they're spatially uh, embedded and structured. And so there's a number of what, what I've called here tenets of, of what we might call labor geography um, that I want to just briefly talk about um, for setting the context for uh, looking at some of the strategies uh, that the ILA adopted in response to containerization, because that's really what I'm interested in, both from a, um, an academic point of view, but also from a political point of view. I'm really interested in, in the issue of strategy and how can we think um, strategically about um, improving uh, workers' lives. So there are, are, are a number of tenets. The first I've just kind of talked about is the idea that social actors' lives then are geographically, or as using our, our special uh, language, spatially um, embedded. Um, and then that the idea that uh, how social actors are geographically embedded um, really then uh, shapes possibilities for their social action. So that uh, we might think about how uh, workers that work for firms that are uh, simply tied into local uh, labor markets 
uh, have different sets of possibilities open to them than those who work for uh, firms that are much more transnational. Medicare or worker compensation funds, no social security tax, no health insurance, no pension contributions. The trucking company may require this independent operator to report daily to the dispatch office to await work, which means he can't seek work orders from more than one company. If he decides to leave one of the unscrupulous contractors, he will be told that he can leave but the truck stays behind, so it can be assigned to a replacement driver. Since the lease has remained with the contractor, he has no recourse. Another common scenario is that a driver gets into an accident and only then discovers that the trunking company has not paid to cover him and his truck on its insurance policy. The cost of the accident may drive him into bankruptcy and or out of the trucking business. Okay, we're gonna step away from our owner operator for a second. Two tra trajectories in the political economy of neoliberal globalization intersect to create this story of exploitation. First, there is the growth of trade, in particular the growth of imported goods from China. Since the Clinton and Bush II administrations agreed to support China's entry into the WTO, which was finalized in 2001, Chinese exports to the U.S. have grown from $102 billion to $300 billion, an increase of more than 180% in just five years. Not surprisingly, this surge overwhelmed the West Coast ports and forced shippers to begin sending goods originating in China through the Panama Canal to East Coast ports. The East Coast ports used to be almost entirely devoted to trade with across the North Atlantic to Europe and to the Caribbean. So this was a new phenomenon, pretty much. The East Coast ports were ill-prepared for the unexpected flood. Congested docks, jammed highways, and long delays along the nation's inadequate railroad tracks are the result. The explosion in imports might have led to soaring freight rates and rising wages for poor truckers had not deregulation, which is the second trajectory of neoliberal globalization, taken place in the U.S. beginning in the late 1970s. Carter-Kennedy reforms brought an end to the regulatory regime which limited the number of trucking companies that could operate on each delivery route, a regime that set freight rates, a regime in which poor truckers were union workers with health insurance, pensions, and industrial workers' wages. After 1981, most drayage companies ceased to be owners of trucks and employers of drivers. Under the new regime, most became brokers with few assets and even fewer responsibilities towards the drivers. Their role is to take orders and schedule pickups and deliveries from port terminals to distribution centers and warehouses, which as we've heard may be as far away as 75 miles from the ports, depending on distribution patterns, land prices, and labor costs. For their role in scheduling the truck movements of their contract drivers, they receive at least half of the freight delivery rate. In a generation, port trucking became a scene of destructive competition, which is again a, a phrase which I learned about in studying the 1870s and 1880s. It's a phrase, destructive competition, that faded out of the American vocabulary. But if you read people describing the, uh, the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, it's a and the Depression, it's a phrase that was used all the time. We've forgotten what destructive competition is. With virtually no barriers to entry, anyone with a phone and fax machine could become a trucking broker. There are now thousands of these brokers 
contracting with uh, somewhere between 50,000 and 75,000 owner operators who constitute 70% of the drayage labor force. The rest are employees. Since these brokers have few, if any, assets or overhead costs, they constantly underbid each other, keeping transportation costs low, but shifting most, much of the cost of doing business onto surrounding communities like the ones that we just heard about in the form of dirty air, congested and broken roadways, and ubiquitous traffic accidents. As independent contractors, owner drivers are treated by the law as independent businesses who have no, they have no collective bargaining rights, as, as you heard yesterday from John, they have no power to join together to negotiate higher rates. In fact, drivers have been sued for violating the federal Sherman Antitrust Act, which was passed at the end of the period, the historical period I've been talking about, 1890. They've been sued for violating that act, for going on strike, or for demanding wage hikes. The low rate drivers receive do not allow them to maintain their trucks. The resulting high maintenance costs keep them from accumulating enough savings to afford to replace their aging trucks with newer ones. The newer ones provide better fuel economy and much less diesel emissions, but the drivers can't afford them. Lack of health insurance means that when a driver or a member of his family gets sick, the driver cannot afford to remain in a job without benefits. As tens of thousands of formerly Teamster Union drivers left the industry, they were replaced by workers with the fewest options. Immigrants from India and Pakistan and Seattle and Vancouver from Central America and Mexico and California, from Cuba and Miami, and from Latin America, Africa, and Asia in New Jersey. Studies by researchers at the West Coast ports, one of whom is going to be speaking in a few minutes after me, shows that the driver's net pay averages less than $11 an hour without benefits for work weeks that it can exceed 60 hours. This is a wage level 30% below what union members earned when drayage was regulated. When you factor in benefits, the income loss exceeds 50%. I just want to talk a little bit about what it means to work 60 hours on congested highways and aging diesel fume spewing trucks. because the daily experience is worse than what that sounds like. Because port truckers are not paid for their time, but for the load, the operators of term terminals, trucking firms, distribution centers, and warehouses have no incentive to invest in technology or to streamline systems so that drivers can maximize the number of deliveries they make per day. Instead, drivers wait on lines to get through the terminal gates to pick up the chassis on which their loads will sit, to exit the ports with their boxes in inspected, to drive through bottlenecks at ramps and bridges leading to and from the port, to deliver and pick up boxes at the loading docks of distribution centers and warehouses, waiting on line, losing time, breathing in diesel fumes from old outmoded trucks leads to disabling stress, heart, and lung disease and cancer. But nobody knows how much because no one has bothered to study the health impacts on these drivers who sit on the bottom of the American logistics supply chain. I understand that there is a study that the National Resources Defense Council is doing about the impact of these conditions on the health of uh, poor truckers in Oakland, but that study isn't out. I've been talking to everybody I can think of in the last year about getting a study of the health impacts on drivers in New Jersey, because when I meet with them, it becomes immediately clear that there are 
terrible health impacts, but I haven't found anybody who's willing to pay for it yet. The fact that drivers are not paid for their waiting time takes a toll not only on their health, but on the efficiency of the logistics chain itself. Since their extra low earnings means that freight rates have remained low, despite the rapid increase in shipping volumes, logistics firms have little incentive to invest in modern equipment to speed up the movement of the trucks carrying containers into and out of the port. In most of America's ports, the chassis which carry containers are old, and the traffic software which manages the flow of the freight and the trucks and the railroads is outdated. Freight rates are so low that it, is, that it is economical for shippers to let their containers sit around at the terminal yards for up to three days awaiting pickup and delivery. And some of the containers sit even longer using the wharves as outdoor warehouses, accumulating late fees. These boxes take up space and clutter the yards, which also means that there are more accidents in the yards than there need to be. Because the freight rates are so low for the containers moving slowly through the congested terminals and highways, most customers don't insist on just-in-time delivery, for which, for which they would have to pay a premium. At a conference last year, Nelson explained to me that Walmart does pay that premium because they want to have just-in-time delivery, but most of the companies in the U.S. don't do it because they find the cheap freight rates to be an adequate substitute. As a result, these shippers have higher inventory and insurance costs, and they lose potential profits when they have to discount, discount items that arrived at the stores too late to satisfy customer demands. If they get the, the product when people are no longer willing to pay full price for them, they may have to sell them for a 50% discount, which is good for us when we go to Macy's, but it cuts into their profits. And I think that's another cost that you have to factor into when you think about how, when you're trying to calculate how inefficient the logistics history, industry is because of the weakness of the port trucking sector. The costs of destructive competition are borne directly by the public in two ways. First, drivers without health insurance have to rely on public hospitals for state-paid emergency medical care. The cost of this emergency care has been rising rapidly, causing state governments to cut back on aid to education, road repair, and housing. And second, the fact that trucking companies don't have to contribute to Social Security to make payments to workers' compensation funds or to make pension contributions intensifies the negative impact on public program budgets. Yet these costs are probably minor when compared to the costs imposed by the negative health impacts of heavy diesel emissions from tens of thousands of trucks with dirty, obsolete engines. In California, researchers estimated that the health impacts of these port-related emissions amount to $19 billion per year. And a study conducted by the New Jersey Environmental Justice Federation on diesel emissions in the ironbound section of Newark projected that by 2010, the cost of the health impacts on community residents from diesel soot would cost New Jersey almost $5 billion annually. Asthma, high death rates from cancer, days missed from work and school, high blood pressure, heart disease, these constitute the toll borne by residents of New Jersey's 11 counties. And if you look on a map, you'll see that those 11 counties that are out of compliance with federal air quality standard are right along the, the truck routes. The people in New Jersey, I don't really think, understand that their state is out of compliance with federal air quality standards, despite the efforts of the environmental movement to publicize that. In California, the destructive competition in port trucking re reached such crisis proportions that residents of communities blighted by dirty air from ships, old trucks, and old diesel train engines organized to insist that something be done to clear the air. John talked about that yesterday. Uh, 
Um, the resistance to the proposals to clean the air have been um, fierce, as you would expect. Uh, Logistics-related businesses are resisting the plans. They want the public to su subsidize retrofitting of old truck engines, and they desperately want to keep Teamsters out of the ports. They are not only lobbying against the clean air plan, they are threatening to tie up the reform process with lawsuits challenging the port's authority to set standards for port trucking. On October 23rd, the Bush administration weighed in, and I bet you could predict what they said. Um, the Department of Transportation's Marine Maritime Coordinator, Sean Connaughton, sent a letter to the director of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach supporting the logistics industry's concerns about the plan to require that trucking companies employ their drivers, and he threatened litigation if the plans go forward. We haven't gotten that far in New Jersey. Uh, environmentalists and labor and faith-based groups and community groups in New Jersey have gotten together to form a, what we call the Coalition for Healthy Ports. Um, but we're just at the beginning stages of a process which in California has been going on for probably more than a decade. And so far, organizations like the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey haven't taken the uh, concerns about the externalities of uh, the growth of freight very seriously. Community envi and environmental groups are reaching out across the country to put excessive diesel emissions from dirty trucks and dockyard equipment and ships and tugboats on the agenda of the national movement to reduce greenhouse gases and meet air quality standards. So about a month ago, three community leaders from the Inland Empire came to New Jersey and asked someone from Change to Win to introduce them to people in the community who are concerned about the environmental impacts. The person from Change to Win called me and I brought them over to St. Joseph's Social Service Center in Elizabeth uh, where they talked about how they had been organizing their communities. And the sister Jacinta at St. Joseph's and one of her young staff people got interested enough so that now one of the staff people is planning to come out here on November 30th to attend this conference. I think that before that meeting, the people in Elizabeth had felt like unemployment and, hopeless, and homelessness were such profound problems in their communities that they weren't able to take the air pollution problems seriously. And I think they've just learned in the last few weeks that they need to take them seriously as well. Uh, this issue about how an unregulated logistics sector is affecting the public is starting to provoke national action. Okay, I'm just about at the end. Change to Win has made organizing the nation's owner operators one of its five top priorities. Uh, in some states like New York and Illinois, uh, the departments of labor are starting to move against misclassification. Uh, Patricia Smith, the Commissioner of Labor in New York, announced on May 3rd the creation of an Immigrants' Rights Bureau within the Department of Labor to be staffed by 10 new labor standards inspectors who are proficient in Spanish and Korean. The Bureau is liaising with immigrant groups throughout the state to ferret out the most egregious labor law violators. Um, so the, my conclusion is that the destructive competition of port trucking labor market is a vivid example of how neoliberal globalization's unregulated growth is unsustainable. And uh, now there are efforts to 
put this issue on the national agenda. Progressive think tanks like Demos, the Century Foundation, and the Economic Policy Institute are beginning to ask whether it's time to put effective regulation back after 30 years of neglect. Uh, I want to end with, by saying that the California Clean Air Action Plan is a good example of what a new balance between the economy and, uh, and the public welfare would look like. Setting standards for the environment, for community accountability, for decent jobs, and for industry efficiency and sustainability. Perhaps more important, the fact that environmental, public health, labor, and community groups have been able to work together successfully to raise public awareness of the issues and to place them high on the public policy agenda is a model for how progressives can confront the challenges pre presented by the forces of neoliberal globalization and deregulation which for the past 30 years have combined to degrade America's environment and labor markets. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks very much, David. Our next speaker is Kristen Monaco from Cal State Long Beach. Advanced technology. Um, I'm actually not going to talk at all about poor truck drivers today, which I hope isn't um, too disappointing, but I talk enough about them that I feel it's, it's getting a little repetitive, so I wanted to do something slightly new, although I can answer any questions about poor drivers people might have. What I'm actually doing is sort of stepping on John's turf a little bit. Um, he claims that he studies the ports of LA and Long Beach now because he started with the Inland Empire as working his way to sort of the source of traffic. What I'm doing is exactly the opposite, starting thinking about port drivers at the ports of LA and Long Beach got me thinking about people working in logistics in the Inland Empire. Oh, before I go on, this research was funded by a grant from Metrans, which is a DOT-funded transportation research center at USC. So, got that out of the way. Um, obviously, there's a lot of issues that have been raised recently with respect to logistics labor markets. And sort of on one side, you have John and others who really advocate this idea that logistics employment is an answer to the decline of manufacturing. So, as manufacturing has Employment has declined in California. Logistics is sort of the next best alternative, um, especially for the demographic we're considering. On the other side, you have this literature um, Edna and Getz have talked about, which is this idea that logistics workers are underpaid. And I think the third question that's arising now, which is more of a public policy concern, is who are these workers who we rely on to move goods? And obviously, this is coming to the forefront now because of the transportation worker ID card or the TWIC, which is going to be implemented at the ports any day now, according to Department of Homeland Security, which basically is going to monitor for both criminal background, but also immigration status, which is obviously an issue with poor truckers. And obviously, we're also interested in the demographics and economic performance of these workers with respect to the clean trucks program, which has been discussed. What I'm really here to present today is sort of some preliminary research, which is a very nice way of saying I'm not quite done with my research, so I threw together a bunch of charts to um, distract you from that fact. Um, the data really looks at a source slightly different than John. Um, so I'm looking at the micro data sets of both the 2000 census and the 2005 American Community Survey, which is also administered by the census. It's just a smaller sample size but both are sort of nationally representative. And these are nice data sets because they have information on both labor market data, so wages, hours, industry, occupation, and the location of your job, but also demographics, gender, race and ethnicity, education, and the location of your residence. And these location issues I'm going to touch on a little bit more in a second. The goal is really to sort of 
take a stab at complementing or bridging existing research, which is this contrast between these are jobs that provide a lot of opportunities and this assertion that these are jobs that provide no opportunities. And I'm not really providing an answer to that, but hopefully providing some information that will help bridge this gap in the research. Um, I think generally it's interesting to look at the labor climate, especially in sort of developing areas, and obviously in Southern California especially, there's a big move to think about environmental justice, which is as we're affecting these communities through development, how are the residents of these communities being affected? Is this a positive or a negative for them? I'm going to focus on the four county areas, so LA, Orange County, Riverside, and San Bernardino. Riverside and San Bernardino, or otherwise known as the Inland Empire, and really want to describe, uh, starting off the distributions of jobs and residences. This is sort of, I think, relevant and important because when we talk about job growth, it's important to note whether the jobs that are being developed are actually going to the residents of the communities. We know the residents of the communities are the ones being affected by congestion and pollution and other negative externalities. The question is, are they also the ones who are benefiting from the job growth that's going on? Um, also want to just look at some basic economic indicators. This is from um, BEA data. Look at the distribution of occupations and industries that I'm going to call goods movement dependent or logistics dependent, which is really manufacturing, wholesale trade, retail trade, and transportation and warehousing. And then finally, look at the returns to education, which is a big issue. What are the returns to human capital investment in these industries? Um, the first is just this table that my husband tells me is unreadable, but it's basically joint probabilities for where people live and where people work, and it sums up to one. But the idea is, is that there's this dispersion in Southern California between where people work and where people live. And I'm from the Midwest, so generally in the Midwest, people work where they live, right? And when I moved here and I got a job at Cal State Long Beach, I said to my boss, where should I live? He said, oh, well, you could live in Long Beach or you could live anywhere else because at the time none of the faculty members actually lived in Long Beach. And I said, well, this is very odd to me. I thought you were supposed to live where you work. But in Southern California, this is obviously this di divergence. And we're just looking at this at the county level. But what we see is that 90% of people who work in LA also live in LA. And that number decreases as we go down. So only 55% of people who work in San Bernardino also live there. Okay, so 45% of the job creation is in fact going to people who live outside the area. And we get a similar sort of situation for Riverside. So in looking at this job creation, it's important to sort of touch on, are the residents benefiting? Where are the residents working? What kind of wages are they earning? Et cetera. Um, looking at sort of stuff we know to be true, we know manufacturing in terms of GDP has declined. It seems to re be rebounding somewhat. But we know wholesale trade is increasing in terms of our real GDP in the state. Transportation is relatively flat. Retail trade has grown over time. When we look at the percent of GDP generated by these industries, manufacturing relatively flat since early 2000, and a slight increase in wholesale trade, but relatively stable. Switching from GDP to employment, because I think what we care about in terms of job growth is obviously this employment issue. Manufacturing jobs are on the decline. We know manufacturing jobs are on the decline. But what's somewhat surprising here is retail trade, wholesale trade, and transportation warehousing have been relatively stable over the past five years with the exception of San Bernardino County. And this sort of builds upon what John said earlier. This is where we get these job growth in these goods movement related industries. Um, if we look at the median weekly wages by occupation and industry, so occupation, our broad occupational categories are running down the, running down the table and industries across in the columns. We see that transportation warehousing in particular provides decent wages at the, manufact at the managerial and professional level, right? So if the median weekly wage in manufacturing for managerial managers and professionals is $1,250 in transportation and warehousing, it's $1,000, which is fairly comparable, right? At the top end of the distribution, people who are professional managers are making 
what we would expect to be decent wages, regardless of what industry they're in. What we see is a lot more divergence once we change out of those occupational categories to sort of less skilled occupational categories. Okay. What's important also is to think about how many jobs there are in each of these categories. So we see that overall, among everyone employed in the four county area, 30.8% of all those working in the four county area are managers or professionals of some sort. When we divide this down by, by industry, we see a very different pattern. So in manufacturing, 26.9% of workers are managers. When we move down to retail trade and transportation and warehousing, only about 12% of the workers are managers or professionals. Okay. There's a lot of people at the bottom generating the jobs at the top end of the distribution. All right. And this is something to think about when we start, sort of start talking about upward mobility and how we move these people up, is that it takes an awful lot of people at the bottom end of the pyramid to feed up into the managerial positions that are available. And obviously your ability to move up and attain is really a function of your education, Hopefully that's the case. I have a bunch of students in the room and I think they still believe that education is going to give them some kind of returns. We see obviously the educational distribution in LA. Um, John mentioned before, we have a lot of people who are sort of at the high school level or below. About 20% of LA residents have a college degree, 8% have a graduate degree. In Orange County, we get the sort of demographic shift we expect where we have more people at the higher end of the educational distribution. But when we look at the Inland Empire, as John said, we have a lot of people with a high school diploma or less. Okay, the overwhelming majority of the, pop, of the people who are working don't have a lot of education. Okay. If we look at sort of now the jobs by place of residence, again, the sample is the four county area most people um, live in LA. The distribution for logistics industries is about the same distribution we see for all industries as a whole. So about 60% of people working in these goods, good movement dependent industries live in LA, 22% in Orange County, 12% in Riverside, 6% in San Bernardino. If we restrict our sample to people who are managers or professionals and look at where these people live, they disproportionately live in Orange County and disproportionately don't live in San Bernardino or Riverside. Okay, so they're sort of underrepresented. Um, you know, what got me thinking about this is I teach in a master's program in global logistics and the students who come out of there, they're professionals working in logistics and they get these great jobs afterwards and they make, you know, obviously a lot more money than I do, but you know, that's the price we pay for being educators as opposed to sort of crane operators or logistics professionals. Um, but the issue is they all wind up working in San Bernardino, but they don't live in San Bernardino, right? And this is sort of the chasm we get here. If we look at handlers, people who are actually handling the goods in these warehouses and distribution centers, what we see is they overwhelmingly don't live in Orange County and they disproportionately live in Riverside and San Bernardino, right? So this is sort of what we get. Um, the lower end of the distribution is obviously handlers. So if we think of the two extremes, managers and professionals on the top end of the distribution ha and handlers on the bottom, again, these are people who are sort of loading pallets, driving forklifts, all the things you think about. The mean earnings are about $12.47 an hour. The median is $9.38 an hour. And when we get this divergence between the mean and the median, what this means is that there's a lot of people at the bottom end of the distribution, and we sort of see their weekly earnings. Um, they comprise 5% of all workers in these goods, depend, goods movement dependent industries um, and 14% of all the production transport workers. 10% of all workers in the transport or warehousing industry and again 20% of all the production and transport workers within that industry subsector. So there are a big chunk of these workers. If we look at their demographics, we know why handlers don't make a lot of money. Handlers don't make a lot of money because they don't have the education, right? Again, most of these handlers, 44.5% have less than a high school degree, 34.5% have a high school diploma. So what, about 80% have a high school diploma or less. Almost none of them have a college or graduate degree, which again is good for my students because when they graduate they'll know, hopefully they won't be handlers. Um, 
They're overwhelmingly Hispanic. So if the percent Hispanic in the overall population is about 30, 32% for the four county area, 68.5% of all these handlers are Hispanic, and about 64.2% of them are full-time. And Getz talked about this yesterday. A lot of these are part-time workers. Um, returns to education. If we think about how you go from being a handler to being a manager and this sort of potential for upward mobility, obviously there's a huge education hurdle to get over, right? These people have a high school education or less. We need to get them trained up if we want them to move up the ladder. If we look at the returns to education, and the way I measure this is the percentage premium that you get for a certain degree versus less than a high school diploma, okay? So high school graduates tend to make about 31% more than people who haven't graduated high school. Graduate, people with a graduate degree make 126% more than people who don't have a high school diploma. This, these returns to education control for all sorts of characteristics. So we're controlling for demographics, gender, race, ethnicity, occupation, all of these things. So these should be the pure returns to education. What we get is a fairly constant return to education in all of these categories, right? You can move up and you can get a return to these degrees, but you have to give these people access to education. Transportation and warehousing is, of course, the grand exception to this. You have a much lower return to education in this industry, right? There's this huge gap, especially, you know, college degree, graduate degree, you're not getting the returns in this industry that you're getting in other industries. Okay, um, so to sort of think about what my conclusions are, and I think I probably have generated more questions for myself than sort of conclusion, we know a couple of things about workers in these industries. Number one is, especially in transportation and warehousing, you have a lot of sort of support workers for every manager or professional occupation, job opening that you sort of generate. Managers and logistics are much more likely to live in Orange County than San Bernardino County. Handlers disproportionately live in San Bernardino County. Again, when we think about developing the Inland Empire and the jobs these are creating, what we want to know is what opportunities are these jobs creating for the residents of that community. There's a large educational differential and the returns to education are lowest in transportation and logistics. Which raises a bunch of questions, not, none of which I'm going to um, answer. but. <laughs> I think should stem some debate maybe between Getz and John or something. I'm not trying to set up fights, but you know, it would punch things up a little bit. Um, the number one question is sort of what's a reasonable rate of pay for logistics support workers, right? There's this idea that they're horribly underpaid and they're horribly exploited. And the question is, you know, if someone's making 10 to $12 an hour and they have less than a high school degree, is this a bad pay scale for them? Is this a reasonable pay scale? Where do we want them to be? How do we get them to sort of that point? What are the career prospects for entry-level workers in these industries? And I think this really involves looking at a lot of different data sets very carefully and sort of saying, if someone enters as, say, a handler, another sort of semi-skilled or unskilled occupation, what's the likelihood that they're actually moving up the chain here and becoming a manager and professional? And what are the returns for that? And then obviously, the big question is, what's the trade-off between job growth and congestion and environmental concerns, right? And this is sort of the pushback we're getting everywhere in Southern California where we say, we need the ports to grow because the ports generate jobs, and people say, but the ports are dirty. And then you say, but they generate jobs, and they say, but we don't have those jobs. And so this is sort of the back and forth we need to think about. And as we get more job growth in the Inland Empire, more environmental groups out there are saying, you know, we're not happy about the increased congestion. We're not happy about the air quality. What kind of returns are we getting when we incur these costs? And then the final question, which I think John presented as well, which is, if we're not doing it in the Inland Empire, where are we going to do all this goods handling? Keep in mind, a big chunk of what comes in through the ports actually stays in sort of the Southern California region. So there's only so far east we're going to be able to push before stuff starts coming back west. Okay. So. Those are my questions. I have no answers, but maybe we can have some nice discourse on that. Honestly, the, the answer was proposed, Shane Hamilton at the University of Georgia, was proposed by Joseph Eastman, who pushed for the Motor Carrier Act of 1935. What he originally wanted was actually let the octopus be. 
you know, forget all this concern about monopoly. Let's have one giant transportation monopoly that is carefully regulated by, you know, federal oversight that will create efficiency. So we can have railroads, we can have trucks, we can have multiple modes of transportation which are used efficiently the way that Walmart, you know, has this kind of octopus-like control over its distribution networks. You know, use government oversight to make sure that there is an efficient transportation infrastructure. But of course, you know, the railroads were not particularly interested in having their, um, you know, operations watched that closely by the ICC. Truckers uh, very much wanted a, a different kind of infrastructure. So regulation itself was always broken up into preserving these inherent advantages, as the 1940 Transportation Act put it. So whether that was ever a legitimate alternative, who knows? But, you know, we are facing a world in which, you know, if containerized shipping is the seamless, you know, the mega octopus, there is a chance for powerful players to actually create the kinds of efficiencies that would demand that, you know, time uh, be uh, a disciplined commodity in terms of these truckers, you know, rather than letting them just sit there with the load, uh, wasting fuel, which is getting increasingly expensive, wasting their time, you know, there could be big players who actually take control of the entire system. Uh, whether it is Walmart or, you know, the other retailers who have the pull power, or if it's, you know, these distribution companies. Um, but, I mean, you, uh, you pose the question whether uh, there will be a push for re-regulation. And I'm curious whether you think that actually is a, a legitimate possibility in the future, that there will be some groundswell you know, like the Granger movement of the 19th century calling for taming of this octopus? Well, I guess uh, when I look at what's been happening uh, in L.A. and Long Beach, uh, it's, it looks to me like that's the beginning of something that... Um, because, I mean, something like six years' worth of uh, modernization and... and uh, and expansion activities at the ports in LA and Long Beach have, have been put on hold because of the demands of uh, the environmental community and concerns about air quality. And I, I right now I'm looking at as possibly the, the leading, you know, edge of a movement to uh, to regulate in the in the uh, interest of preserving the environment and public health and so on. In that light, I might add that at LA and Long Beach, one of the interesting phenomenon that you run into is that a large number of the trucking companies in fact want to see greater regulation of who gets to go in and out of the gate because they recognize that effectively perfect competition, which is what we have, has been a race to the bottom and they see some regulation of the industry which in effect raises their costs as making it more difficult from what they term the bottom feeders to be in the market because they won't be able to afford to be. So that there's actually on both sides of the table there some interest in the same outcome. Um, just to jump on that real quick. Um, I think one of the issues talking about what's going to happen with the Clean Air Action Plan and the number of trucking companies, as you actually shrink the number of trucking companies, there are potential for efficiencies there. A lot of the waiting time is because the terminals don't have the container ready for the truck when the truck pulls up. And the sort of idea that you have hundreds of trucking companies with thousands of drivers all showing up to look for one specific container, when most of the containers are going to the same place anyway, is a little odd in, a, in you know, sort of a perfect world. A truck driver goes there, they pick up the load that's ready, and they take the load that's ready where it's supposed to go. If you had fewer firms, you could have a lot more sort of coordination between terminals and trucking companies, which is lacking right now. If, trucking, if truckers were like cab drivers, you would eliminate a lot of the, of the waiting. Over here. Yes, um, Mark Strauss, FX File Architects and Planners. I I'm an architect and planner who's been working significantly with um, industrialized properties that, have, that are, are moving um, towards um, redevelopment from, from a, um, um, generally speaking, waterfront properties that have been being developed for commercial uses. And I'm wondering from a land use point of view, if maybe our communities are moving too quickly to eliminate these industrial areas um, that are no longer um, 
working for industrial purposes. And I'm wondering if part of the problem from an environmental point of view with regard to the, the shipping industry is that with, with that we have too much concentrations in one in, in too few loca locations, and that maybe that if one were to um, really make use in a larger way uh, with regard to the industrial landscape and not try to keep narrowing it and narrowing it, there might be more opportunity um, for more um, locations that can serve um, the um, transportation industry in a way that that might create more efficiencies so you wouldn't have all the waiting time in, in, in these locations for, for the trucking. Is that a, um, is, is, is there, is that something that anybody's looking at in terms of expanding the locations for, for these kinds of ports in order to create more efficiencies? What I'm observing, which kind of goes along with what I was saying in my presentation, is that the sizes of the facilities, because of the technologies used inside the buildings, has been growing almost at an exponential rate. Now, when I first started studying the Inland Empire, a 100,000 square foot building was regarded as enormous. We now have that I can count 7 million square foot plus buildings under construction. The amount of dirt that that requires because of the kinds of technologies inside the buildings really almost obviates putting them in the coastal counties because land is just too expensive. And its highest and best use is for, for something else. That of course creates the transportation issue of how the heck do you get the stuff from the ports inland. And that's the $40 billion question that we're all trying to face right now. And a, a lot of what we're thinking about, quite frankly, is it's going to ultimately have to be a user fee basis, probably using container as the, as the source of the revenue, uh, with ultimately industry's opposition dropped if, in fact, they can see a bottom line because of efficiency of, of throughput and reliability, which is showing up in our system in Southern California now, but before this is over is going to show up in every urban environment around the ports in the United States. Actually, I, the question um, makes me want to add something, which is I think that uh, the fact that the Inland Empire has been growing is obscuring uh, the fact that the logistics industry is looking for uh, lower cost, less regulated alternatives. And so Prince Rupert in uh, Canada uh, Savannah in, on the East Coast and Norfolk are getting lots of new capital invested because people are looking for places where the land is cheap, where the uh, environmental regulations aren't strong, where labor is cheaper and where they have less congestion. And so, you know, I think that probably will be a lot of reconfigurations. And I, another thing that we should add to that that was mentioned <laughs> yesterday is that in, in many cities, the, the developers and the city governments are deciding they'd rather have the uh, coastal region uh, be developed for high cost housing rather than for commercial purposes. And so they're driving out or limiting the growth of the ports. Okay, we'll take one more, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, John Zrolnik from Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. Um, and at the risk of belaboring uh, this discussion of, of port trucking, I, I did want to address a question earlier uh, about the status of the LA Long Beach plan, because we've obviously been doing a lot of work on that at Lane and, and through the Coalition for Clean and Safe Ports. Um, what has been recently passed in the past couple weeks uh, and you know, John referred to it as you know as as a, as a, a full package, um, and I would I would slightly disagree with that. Um, I, I would also say at the outset that the, a lot of the work that that John has done uh, on this point uh, through his uh, economic uh, analysis report that came out recently has been phenomenal uh, and very useful, showing 
illustrating really clearly how it is a failed market and how the marginal costs uh, are, are very easily uh, absorbed. Um, but what was, what was passed recently uh, is not a, a comprehensive package. It, it's essentially the, these tariffs, these rules that the ports have separately adopted uh, are a restatement of goals. Um, you know, by this date we want these trucks gone, by this date we want these trucks gone. It contains nothing about how to actually sustain, um, as, as David mentioned, uh, such a program, uh, nothing about um, how to, you know, prevent uh, a, the crisis from reoccurring, um, and it, it, it doesn't address uh, the thrust that, that I was trying to make in, uh, yesterday, that you can't separate the environmental impact uh, from the economic structure. Uh, and so, uh, John did say that by the 12th, uh, I'm sorry, by, by the 14th of December, the ports have stated that they want to come back with a full package that would address all of this stuff. They have not yet, uh, and if they don't do that, um, then what was recently adopted uh, is going to be just another press release uh, and we're not going to see the, the improvements that are desperately needed on both the environmental and public health side and the economic side for the, for, for the driver. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be That's done. That's very accurate. I agree with that. Um, just to stir up the pot a little bit more, because um, there is this issue of the difference between altering the environmental regulations and altering the labor landscape. Um, John was giving me some interesting information about truck driver preferences this morning, and I think this is an issue that a lot of people have been curious about. If you mandate that these truck drivers become employees, how do the truck drivers feel about this? What is their reaction going to be? And does this take opportunities away from them as sort of entrepreneurs, we know truck drivers get a return to their investment once they've paid off the truck. Under an employment model, they don't get that return. And so there have been a series of sort of questions about whether they're interested in becoming employees. And maybe John wants to just give a little blurb on that. Well, it starts with your work and then transitions over to our work because uh, Kristen and I have both worked on this issue and it also has had work from uh, Change to Win looking at this issue. And what we just completed, I didn't do it, my uh, affiliated firm that's also working on this stuff did it. They interviewed truckers um, back in the summer and then again uh, a little over a week ago and asked the question, uh, if you were paid $20 an hour and you had the package of state benefits, workers, com uh, workers comp, uh, disability, social security, and if there was driver paid insurance, would you be willing to become an employee as opposed to an independent operator? Um, and then for those who said no, the follow-up question was, all right, we really don't believe you, do you have an alternative strategy? That is, do you have something else that you say you would do if in fact the port said you must become an employee to come through the gate? The results are startling and um, difficult to understand. And I was talking with Change to Win, one of the gentlemen the night before last, 50% said no. And of that 50%, only about 6% did not have an alternative strategy that they indicated they would go to. Now, I don't understand that answer, uh, but it, if the, we then weighted it by throughput, which is one of the issues you constantly have to worry about, is whatever goes on at the porch, you want to have, when it's all said and done, still have the cargo moving, because it's, it's a huge impact on the economy, an excessive 1.3 million jobs in the southwestern section of the U.S. Um, so it's hard to, when we, when we weighted it by throughput, it came out to 65% of the throughput said no. Now, I don't know what to do with a result like that because do I believe it? It is consistent with the answer we got in the summer, and it's consistent, I believe, with the work that Kristen has done. So we keep hearing this. Uh, and it just doesn't square with what you had to say, but it is what they keep telling us. So I don't know what to do with it other than that's to report it. I, 
You know, this is, can I say something? All right. Uh, this relates to the, the historical work I did about uh, craft and consciousness um, when I studied the hatting industry. You know, I, I do believe that the owner operators think of themselves as uh, pirates of the highway. Uh, they have a very independent mentality. They want to be entrepreneurs. They think that somehow they're going to figure out how to game the system and make a lot of money at it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've thought about this the way John and talked about. I don't think that they have a realistic uh, plan for how they can achieve that goal. And uh, I, when I realized how deep their attachment was to that occupational identity, um, I thought long and hard about um, what was going to happen when the Teamsters came in. And, and, uh, but I realized that, you know, without the pressure from environmentalists, there was no hope of changing the, the, uh, the poor truckers' jobs. And the input from the environmentalists was only going to be effective if it was in conjunction with the union and turning the job into an employee job. I don't see any other way of helping the, the truck drivers um, get out of the bind that they're in. So, you know, I, I can't guarantee that they're going to end up being union members, but I just think that this is the only way that they, their conditions can be improved. Thanks very much. It's been fun, but we're out of time. Please join me in thanking the panelists for a great session.